Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here, as you've just heard. What I want to start with is, uh, is the human ingenuity part of my title. If we, if we go back in time to the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, or even before that, to the beginning of the scientific era, we can congratulate ourselves in terms of the improvement of human well-being that has arisen from that. And a measure of the improvement of human well-being, one simple measure is lifespan. Human lifespan, even at the beginning of the 20th century, was around 40 years. Uh, and here we are at the beginning of the 21st, I have a grandson whose life expectancy is about 100. And that is, by the way, a continuing linear increase, subject for later discussion. All of that improvement in human well-being has shifted around the world, and it was the, probably the British Empire that was the major reason why that well-being spread so rapidly. Now, there's a follow-through from human well-being improving very quickly, which is many more young children being born live to maturity. Of course, that's what we like to see. If we look at Britain in the Middle Ages, on average, a woman had seven or eight children, on average, of which only two survived into maturity taking an average over hundreds of years. And the result is, because 2.1 is the magic figure for a stable population, that our population was relatively stable. Then along came the, that industrial revolution, and quite suddenly, human well-being improved, and five, six, and then seven children on average were surviving into maturity. And women tended to do what their mothers had done. And for two generations, in other words, they also did what their grandmothers did, then suddenly something happens that men don't quite understand, which is that women only have two children on average. Women do seem to get it that in order to have a stable population, uh, two is the right number of surviving children. And so we're back into a stable situation. And of course, what I've just described to you for Britain happens around the whole world. The most recent example is South America, where Female fertility has dropped very rapidly over the last 30 years from 5 to 2.2. Uh, what, what we therefore see is that an upshot of this massive improvement in human well-being has been a population explosion which is now coming under control. And so we have a sublinear growth in population. We must anticipate a population of 9.5 billion or thereabouts by mid-century as a result of that. That's going to be the given of my talk. And I want to say, I'm not averse to the idea that female education, female empowerment, and availability of contraceptives is a key to stabilizing that population. But the most important factor is the size of the rising middle class. More and more people around the world are behaving like you and I in terms of consumption. Now, I don't think we should criticize them for that. Far from it. This is a product of improved human well-being. But it is a fact of life that human consumption around the planet is now creating a resource scarcity crisis of an enormous magnitude. Now, it's a crisis of enormous magnitude precisely because we tend to behave like our grandparents. Uh, inertia in our social behavior means that we want to go on consuming in the same way as we've done in the past and in the developing world, they would like to consume in the same way as we've done in the past. So the problem is inertia in human behavior. And the subject of my talk is to demonstrate that we can manage with nine and a half billion people on this planet, with extremely good human well-being, but we can only do it. In the second part of my uh, 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 title of my talk, sorry, I should have pressed it on. The second part of the title of my talk is the demand for some form of collective action. We, we need to use our human ingenuity instead of for progressing individually our well-being and go beyond, I'm talking about rampant consumerism amongst a small group of our societies, going beyond human well-being, go beyond that into 
working collectively between nations and across the board to manage what I consider to be the biggest challenges, series of challenges our civilization has ever had to face up to. So there's the, the big starting point of what I have to say. And the, here's my carousel. So nine and a half billion people, that's a sublinear growth. Consumption is exponential growth. Right, so sitting on top of this population, we have an exponential growth in consumption. These are the major pressure points that are resulting from that, and I'm just going to illustrate some of these uh, in my talk. My colleague who's following me is going to give you uh, some of the, the detail just to, uh, to, to follow through. So we, we're boxing and coxing here. So if we look at this, one of the issues that we human beings have is that we tend to focus down on a single problem and try and deal with it in that way. Uh, I'm a physicist and so I have to tell you this is a many body problem. And I, just to illustrate that, take water resource. I could start at any point on this carousel. Take water resource. If you look at the state of Victoria in Australia, you would find what used to be the vegetable garden of Australia it is no longer. The farming community is having to shut down. Basically because rainfall has decreased and the non-saline aquifers have been pumped of water and are now empty. You had companies like Pepsi, Coca-Cola, SAB, Biller buying up land in order to get water under the land. That's gone. And so the state of Victoria is having to manage water scarcity at a major level, just to keep the cities going, Melbourne and other towns and villages. Desalination is one route forward. They also, by the way, have introduced a remarkable degree of efficiency in, in water usage. Massive transformation has occurred in that state. We can do it if we put our minds to it. That's going to be the message. But the solution to desalinate water is a problem. Why is it a problem? There's a piece of technology we should welcome. It's a problem because desalination is an energy-intensive process. You are the, in Australia, what you see is that they are converting coal into water. And it's a, it's a very large amount of energy that is used to create a litre of water. In some countries, in the Middle East, they're converting oil into water. So what, what we see is poor behaviour. Why poor? For several reasons. One is scarcity of resources, one of them being oil. The other is the connectedness across the, uh, the diagram I'm showing you here. Water resource, scarce, use desalination, as is widely used in the Middle East, and you're creating another problem, which is that you're emitting carbon dioxide, go right across, climate change uh, is, uh, is a major issue. So we burn coal, we create fresh water, but we're also causing climate change, and by the way, the scientific community is fairly clear about the reasons for the increased desertification in South Australia, it's climate change. So you, your solution is exacerbating the problem that you're trying to deal with. So I'm afraid one of the challenges for us going forward is can we look at this as a collective problem? Can we find solutions that don't impair other parts of the problem? So it, it is a kind of systems analysis that is required to tackle a problem of this magnitude. Of course it means that then individuals can burrow into each problem, but you need to oversee the whole situation with a detailed systems analysis. Energy security and supply, I'm going to talk about in a bit more detail. Uh, if, we, if we look at food production, then of course what, what we do need with this rising consumption exponential rising consumption, and worst of all, beef. Um, uh, I'm not going to criticize them for delivering beef to us last night, um, but, but I do take it as a way of expressing this. The average uh, area occupied by cattle in Mato Grosso in Brazil, anyone know? It's, it's one hectare per, per cow, per cattle. Beef is a, a big land user and water user. And of course, the loss of the Amazonian forests is driven by our demand for beef. As our demand goes up, we're seeing the forests go down. And one of my messages is, don't point a finger. 
the, point, the finger should be pointed at ourselves. It's our own consumption behavior that is causing the demand that causes the behavior that we then tend to criticize. So as we move forward food production, we need an, uh, a second and a third series of green revolutions. We need to use all the technology at our disposal. We need to use technologies that will enable us to produce flood-resistant rice, that will produce uh, saline-resistant crops, that will produce drought-resistant crops, uh, disease-resistant. And of course, we do have a technique for doing that, and it's called GMO. Unfortunately, it's called GMO. Now, it is the most sophisticated te technique available to us for producing the second and third green revolutions that we need. We need to improve cr the amount of crop we get per drop. That's the key. In other words, we need to be much more efficient in producing uh, f food crops per drop of water that is used if we're going to manage this problem. Because, as I've already mentioned, fresh water in the, uh, is the other part of this uh, this crazy problem that we have. Now, if we increase land use for food production wantonly and without recovering poor land, and there are good examples of that happening, then we're going to simply remove the forests. And my fear is because of the demand for food, that is exactly what will happen. So despite the United Nations setting up a red plus process, despite the Norwegian government pumping hundreds of millions of pounds, into saving forests, the demand for food is such that there's almost an inevitability about it unless we change behavior. So removing the forests, why is that a problem? It's not only the loss of the ecosystems, that genetic variety that is so crucial to our continued development. It's the ecosystems are what we co-evolved with and we are now in danger of destroying that very system that uh, is, is perfect for us. When, when I hear very well-known cosmologists talking about uh, finding another planet that, uh, that might be suitable for mankind, um, I, I despair. Another planet with exactly the right atmosphere, the right gravity, the right, you know, there, there, there is no such thing. This is our only planet and we have to take good care of it. So there's the, the basic message. Um, if we don't manage this, conflict and terrorism becomes a major part of the problem because a solution for a single country, the hegemon, is going to be to use its power to look after its own country. The hegemon I would refer to, for example, is the United States. Very powerful, very concerned to look after the American population. And the example I would give you is going into Iraq. I have no doubt, and I was in the British government at the time, that the reason for going into Iraq was shortage of oil supply in the United States of America. How do we secure that? We change a regime and make sure we get a regime friendly to us to secure future oil supplies. That's not a solution either, by the way. The Iraq war is estimated by Joe Stiglitz, the Nobel Prize winner, to have cost about uh, uh, three trillion dollars. When I went into the White House to talk to uh, George Bush about uh, managing these problems in another way, um, I was told, uh, David, you, you can do it in Europe, but we're not going to do it because it would destroy our economy. What has destroyed the American economy is spending $3 trillion in an attempt to secure oil supplies. I think future historians looking back will say this was the first of the great 21st century resource wars, unless we manage our affairs in a different way. I'm going to come back to this, but let me just uh, move on with a, a few examples, um, and, uh, and then I do want to leave enough time for uh, plenty of questions. Climate change. When I came into government, I was determined to see that there was action on what I consider to be the biggest of all of these challenges. And so let me just quickly say a few words about the science of climate change. When I came into government, we had detailed data taking us back on paleoclimatology back 300,000 years. I'm now showing you data with thousands of scientists now working in this area. The field is moving week by week. I'm showing you data 
going back 60 million years in the top curve. This is the temperature of the planet on the uh, uh, vertical axis, and this is the time from the present day on the right-hand side to 60 million years ago on the left-hand side. The, the data has been obtained from ocean sediment data, and the ocean sediment data turns out to match ice core data remarkably well, as I'm about to show you. So we've got a lot of confidence in this data. What we see is that about 50 million years ago, the planetary temperature was about 10 to 12 degrees centigrade higher than it is now. Greenhouse gases are estimated at that time, I'm going to give you the numbers, to be above 1,000 parts per million, driving the average global temperature up to 12 degrees centigrade above our current level, 10, 12 degrees. Now, what does that mean? Well, at that temperature, large mammals could barely survive between the tropics. Uh, what we see is that uh, at that time, the Antarctic, which of course had no ice, uh, was, uh, was basically a, tropical, a subtropical forest with large mammals. Um, in real estate terms, that's where we would all be wanting to buy land if we return to that condition. So basically, as the planet cools down, oh, and, and I should also say, and sea levels, 150 meters higher than today because all of the land-based ice has filled up the sea and the ocean is warmer and expanded. So what, what we have is a period of 30 million years while the planet gets rid of the excess greenhouse gases by various mechanisms, natural, natural, I don't know why human beings aren't counted as natural, but that's, that's another issue. Um, and so it, it, greenhouse gases fall to a level which is approaching 300 parts per million, and at this point the temperature is, is now getting much more comfortable for us larger mammals. And so our predecessors and uh, hominids begin to appear uh, in Africa at this point. So Africa is now not a bad place for us to be. Impossible at that point 50 million years ago. So where the, the noise on the curve, by the way, isn't noise at all. The data is far more accurate than that. What has happened from about 3 million years ago is that the uh, planetary temperature has become bistable. It, it is either rather warm or rather cold, and it's oscillating between the two. It's never stable. Uh, it's always going to oscillate. And the reason is simply a flip of the, the Earth's axis every 100,000 years. Now, as we go forward, though, we've got good temperatures. We evolve, and I'm going to just expand the, the uh, last little box, the last 400,000 years down here. And I'm also now switching to ice core data. So we've got ice core data going back 850,000 years. We can't get ice core data going much further back for several reasons, one of which is ice wasn't around 50 million years ago. Right? So it's very good to have this range of ice core data to match up to the sediment core data and matches up extremely well. So what I'm showing here on an expanded scale and slightly confusing, blue, white, and red shows the temperature red, a warm period, so these are the oscillations, and, and uh, blue is an ice age. So here's the frequency of the warm periods, roughly 100,000 years, over the last 400,000 years. And we come to the current warm period, beginning 18,000 years ago, and rising to a very surprisingly stable temperature for the last 12,000 years. Don't forget, sea levels are changing as well every 100,000 years. So as we go into a warm period, we're melting ice on land from mountaintops and from uh, Antarctica, etc. We're melting ice going into the oceans. Oceans are 100 meter change in sea level. So the map of the world changes as we go from an ice age to a warm period. Well, that's a bit disappointing because of this 12,000 years, there's no coincidence, the period of our civilization. We, we needed some stability in the temperature. We've been building our cities very largely on ocean coasts. It's been for, for massively convenient reasons. 80% of our cities are on coastlines. If we were to return the temperature to that period 50 million years ago, we would lose those cities. The, that's the, the first thing to say. Ocean level rise 
is one of the two challenges, the two major challenges, temperature and ocean level rise. So, question, why have we had such a fortunate long warm period? And it may well be that this is the beginning of the Anthropocene, the, the climate period where our behavior is altering the climate pattern of the world. What did we do? We started taking forests out. Forests pump carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so the stability of the level of carbon dioxide has been disturbed. And in yellow, I'm showing here, because we've got ice core data, we've got bubbles captured from the past in the ice cores. And so we know what the composition of the atmosphere was at the same time. So in yellow, I'm showing you the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And it's taken from the same data set, and so I've just superimposed the data by normalizing this point and this point. I haven't done anything else to the data. And what I think anyone can see is that there, even the skeptic has to admit that there's some sort of correlation between the carbon dioxide levels and the temperature. We see that for every ice age, carbon dioxide levels are about 200 parts per million, and for every warm period, about 260 to 270 parts per million. Now, what uh, some of us think, this is certainly a conjecture, is that what began to happen here, this is the carbon dioxide level going up in the current warm period, and then it, it creeps upwards instead of stabilizing and coming down as has happened previously. Now, this may be because we started taking forests out. Forests were producing a reduction in carbon dioxide levels. We take them out and up went the carbon dioxide levels. So, beginning of farming is what I'm saying we can credit to that, uh, that uh, possibly credit to that change. But then something much more dramatic happens. You'll see the sudden rise in carbon dioxide levels up to the present level, uh, which occurred, of course, at beginning in Manchester, the Industrial Revolution. We fired up the Industrial Revolution by burning fossil fuel, which is nature's way of sequestering excess carbon from the atmosphere. Right, so we're, we're removing that stuff under the crust of the planet at a very high rate because that, I've already said to you, that wonderful industrial revolution that improved our human well-being nevertheless left us with a massive hangover, which is the potential to completely alter the temperature system of the planet in a way that is dangerous for our future. This is going up at two parts per million per annum, and it's a measure of our economic growth because our economies grow in line with our, our uh, burning of, car of carbon. And so it, there's been a slight faltering at the beginning of 2007, 2008, and it's taken off again, not because our economies have taken off, but because the economies of the emerging powers <coughs> is still uh, 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 motoring on. So there's the, the nature of the, the climate challenge. And there's also the key message of what we need to do. We need to defossilize our economies, and we've got how long to do it. I'm estimating that we've got 40 years to completely defossilize our economies. Now, here's the problem inertia. I've already mentioned inertia. I think it's our biggest enemy. By 2017, the coal-fired power stations that will have been built and put in place around the world and will have 40 years to run will already burn enough coal over their lifetime to put us into a situation where the temperature rise will be more than 2 degrees centigrade. Um, if we keep building coal-fired power stations after 2017, then the temperature goes up and up beyond that. We are currently on course for a 5 to 6 degree centigrade temperature rise as we move through this century. And we haven't deviated from that course, despite discussions at many different levels, and I've been heavily involved in those. Here's what's the, the consequence to date. <clears throat> You'll see in blue the ocean level data. This is from the Proudman Institute in Liverpool. Um, why, why have we Brits got such wonderful measurements? It's back to that uh, British Empire. Um, we measured everything in sight, and we measured it with great uh, reproductive capability. Temperatures we measured three feet above ground in the shade. 
Sea levels, we use, again, very appropriate reprodu reproducible mechanisms. I just remind you, the map of India was measured by the British Raj. It took a very long time and a very large number of people died, surprisingly large number, mapping India. Who led the team? A chap called Everest, who in that process found the highest mountain on the planet. So we, we were measurers. And we, we, all that the Proudman Institute has done here is to gather the data from ocean levels around the British Empire. And they, so it's a very consistent set of data. And you'll see that the ocean level is rising uh, very substantially, and that is a, a matter of a, a great concern. Ocean temperature rise is a good proxy for temperature. Not much of this rise so far is due to the melting of ice. Most of this is just the warming of the ocean. It's a much better proxy than the measurements of air temperature, because air temperature is very, um, um, the, the density of gas is such that the air temperature variation is substantial, winds blow. And so what you see with the temperature, air temperature, the red data, it shows roughly the same trend, but there, it's much more, uh, um, it deviates uh, considerably more. There's, there's a lot of weather impact on the, the air temperature measurement. All right, so we've got a, 0.8 degrees centigrade temperature rise behind us over the last 100 years, and over the next 100 years, we've got another 5 degrees centigrade uh, temperature rise in front of us. That's roughly the message from the scientific community today, unless we change our behavior. And the consequences of that, as I've said, is the, the beginning of the loss of our major cities. Uh, and we can, we can discuss which cities are most vulnerable. Um, let me now just switch to the issue of resource supply. I mentioned the Iraq war. Let me just show you what underlies that concern. So what, what we've done here is reanalyze the conventional oil supply and demand. Conventional oil is that crude oil that comes spouting out of the ground when you puncture uh, into uh, an oil re reservoir. And so in black, we're showing the billions of barrels uh, discovered as new oil fields each year. And in red, we're showing the oil consumed by humanity. Now, anyone who can integrate knows that the area under the red curve can never exceed the area under the black curve. You can't burn more oil than you've got under the ground. And so all we've done in extrapolating forward on this plot is take that principle that the area under the red curve, let's put it equal to the area under the black curve. So we recover all the oil that has been discovered. And then we have to allow for further discoveries. Um, now what, what we've done looks pessimistic, but it isn't. Let me say the OPEC countries have been overstating their oil reserves, we estimate, by about 30%. So we've dropped the, the level of uh, oil reserves uh, significantly. So as we move forward from 2010, we indicate here, and the demand curve is in blue, we see that the demand cannot be met by the red curve. If you think it can be met by pushing, squeezing oil supplies up, that will only bring the red curve uh, down much more sharply as we go forward in time. But actually, this is the optimal Crude oil production rate. As oil wells are depleted, it becomes more and more difficult to recover the oil. So we fed that into the equation as well. All right, so what this means is that we need to decouple our economy from oil dependence anyway. Let me just uh, emphasize that with uh, a recent result that we've uh, published in Nature. And this rather surprised me. All we've done here is to... Plot crude oil production in millions of barrels per day as a function of world spot price for oil. And you'll see that actually the turning point was 2005. So we're describing this as elastic behavior. As a physicist, I'm seeing a phase transition in 2005. And so what's happening is that oil price goes up from $15 a barrel in the year 1999 to $40 a barrel in the year 2005, and crude oil production goes up from roughly 64 million barrels a day to 74, 75 million barrels a day. That's elastic supply demand. 
since 2005, the oil price has gone up from 40 to $140 a barrel, and the production hasn't yet gone above 75 million barrels a day. We've already reached a plateau in oil production capacity. For some reason, our economists don't want to pick up on this. Um, the, the crisis in the Euro economy is at least in part driven by what you're looking at here. The Italian economy, everyone knows, is in the red. 38 billion euro per annum. With the oil price rise since 2005, Italy is now paying for imported oil an additional 34 billion euro per annum. So the, the Euroland crisis is partly due to the fact that we're now spending in Europe half a trillion, dollar, half a trillion euro per annum on imported oil. Our economies cannot stand that. We, we were pretty good at managing $15 a barrel, but when we've gone to nine times that price, it's put our economies at risk. The US economy, similarly at risk. Uh, more like $350 uh, billion per annum the Americans are spending on imported oil. So what we're seeing here is just the first, I believe, of the real resource crises arising from human pressure on the planet's resources. So not only are we putting the global commons at risk, temperature, climate change, atmosphere, we're also putting our very resource capacity production at risk if we don't find uh, smart alternatives as, as we go forward. So the rest of the talk is now to try and raise your spirits. <laughs> there, are, there are solutions, there are solutions. And here, here's the, 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 the very best of these, I think. I know this looks like a very complicated diagram, but this is really to show you there's been an enormous amount of research to produce this, uh, this piece of work. And uh, I give tribute to Julian Allwood at Cambridge for leading this. On the left-hand side, I can explain it very simply. On the left-hand side, we're showing all of the primary energy used around the planet to produce what we need per annum. 475 exajoules, never mind the units, that's 475 uh, times 10 to the 18 joules uh, we burn every year. Primary energy. Primary energy, I mean coal, renewables, nuclear, gas, biomass, oil. And the product, after we've used direct fuel use, conversion devices, the product is useful energy. And useful energy is motion, heat, etc. The product is 55 exajoules worth of useful energy. So we are extraordinarily wasteful in every aspect of this conversion process. This isn't just second law of thermodynamics. This isn't the Carnot cycle. This is waste, energy waste, all the way through. So what, what we're seeing is a system where at every level on this diagram, there's an opportunity for companies to come through with market-facing solutions that will save energy, save money, and save the planet. So it's as simple as that. Now, I, I think what, what you would say is, OK, but that, Im that implies an investment up front. My argument at the moment is that the Western economies are crippled by the cost of energy, and we need a stimulus into our economies that changes the direction of our economies so that we use stimulus funding. Instead of quantitative easing going to the banks, I'm saying let's have directed quantitative easing into projects that will stimulate our economy into a sustainable direction. So uh, that sounds like a political speech. That was me in politics for some time. Here's, here's the other basic message. We developed our economies to that amazing state in the 19th and early 20th centuries following roughly the diagram indicated here. Science, technology, engineering, driving it through into innovation, manufacturing, and wealth creation, and surplus wealth creating human well-being. That was the magical circle that developed our industrial revolution. Obviously, I've simplified it, but I just want to point out what subsequently has happened. We've broken that virtuous chain because the companies, the capitalist system, is always going to try and reduce its cost to be more competitive, 
no blame here, you find that you can go offshore, get cheaper labor, and so you move your manufacturing offshore. I'm going to make a statement. The United States has almost no manufacturing capacity left that is not related to the military. And that is publicly funded. So now, now we, we go offshore. So where do the US companies get their chips from? They're not manufactured in the United States. That's what I mean. And so we, they create goods which we import and now we've broken the chain from science, technology, innovation to manufacturing to wealth creation. Now, I believe that the way forward on this is to demonstrate to the world, and again, why shouldn't we be in the forefront, sorry, that we can create an alternative pathway, which is a lean, green manufacturing industry emerging to demonstrate sustainability and in which very few people are used to produce the goods so that uh, we can keep costs down. But nevertheless, we manage our balance of payments. Now, that, that is the issue I just wanted to raise. Balance of payments has disappeared from view. And yet, we have a balance of payments crisis in Europe and a looming crisis in the United Kingdom. So this is a balance of payments analysis. If it looks like an engineering drawing, you're quite right, it is an engineering drawing. This doesn't look like an economist's analysis at all. It's a flow chart. And we're looking at the, the flow of services. I know this is illegible here. The width of the curve is the value of the uh, incoming goods. So these are services, gas, uh, I can't read that, agriculture and goods. And uh, so w what we have is imported goods, and then this is what we export. So this inside the box is the British economy. What we're exporting is services and goods. And we have to try and keep those in balance. The internal economy is managed because we do have a large income from foreign uh, um, investments abroad which create an income stream to manage the balance of our balance of payments. But here's the problem for Britain as we move forward in terms of its uh, national economy. A horribly complex looking diagram, but don't worry. I just again want to point out something important from it. This is the internal economy, and again outside the box is what we bring in from outside. Look how vast the internal economy is. It's not independent, but we have a large amount of stuff manufactured goods, etc., that we don't export, that, uh, that keeps us in balance. Jobs. This is what we create with jobs in green. That's uh, good stuff. Oil in, in purple at the top. Where's that come from? That's from the North Sea. Our North Sea oil bonanza has created an income stream for Britain, which is about as big as the entire job force. Right. Now, as we as we move forward in time, you'll see that there's a purple line now coming in from outside. We are no longer producing enough oil to meet our demands. And the frightening thing is that the North Sea oil bonanza is now over. We've passed our peak in oil production. So we, we were producing 3.1 million barrels a day back in 1999. There's the, the peak in our oil production. And we are now down to 1.4 million barrels a day. We need 1.6 million barrels a day to maintain the British economy with its current oil dependence. So as we move forward over the next 20, 30 years and we go down to zero oil from the North Sea, we're going to have to replace that big purple patch of income for Britain with something else. We're not going to do that with exported manufactured goods or with exported services. It's too vast for our economy to manage. The only way to manage this is to create energy internally in the country. And that, of course, is precisely what we should be doing. Whether we do it with microgeneration, with uh, wind turbines, with nuclear power, everything we do needs to be to generate our energy systems within country to manage our balance of payments going forward. And this isn't only true of the UK. This ought to be operating uh, throughout the world. We can do it. We know what technologies we can turn to. And 
When I was in government, I stimulated the formation of a Department of Energy and Climate Change to try and pull this problem together into a single department. And that department is now progressing rather well, despite the uh, hesitations of the... Um, my wife's doing this. <laughs> <laughs> despite the hesitations of the uh, um, uh, coalition process, the Department of Energy and Climate Change has a, a superb plan for taking this forward. The problem is it needs government at cabinet level and prime minister level to grasp the nettle and push it through. And at the moment, I'm afraid that simply isn't happening. So we, we do have the plans. Uh, I'm wo still working closely with government on those plans. We can manage this. So this is the smart green advanced manufacturing sector that I'm also arguing for to create internal to our economy as we move forward. Now, let me finish by saying something about um, ex uh, imported goods, but at a different level. So this is a map of the world in which we're showing the movement of goods produced by uh, uh, the emissions of carbon dioxide. And we're simply measuring this in terms of the uh, millions of tons of carbon dioxide per year that have gone into producing those goods. And you'll see that all of the arrows begin in the purple area, that is China, and the biggest black arrow is going into the United States. So when we say the Chinese per person are now producing as much carbon dioxide as the US citizens, we're leaving this out. Right? Most of the carbon dioxide produced in China goes into goods that we buy. And you'll see that the biggest arrows are going to the United States from, from China, going to Europe, and going to Japan. That is, of course, the engine of the Chinese economic growth, because each of those arrows has an equivalent money arrow going in, in the other direction. Money arrows are going from our countries to China, fine. They're going from our countries to the Middle East for oil, not so fine. That's uh, more than a trillion dollars a year net, um, and the net result is that we're not even accounting for carbon dioxide emissions properly. So my point is that we will need to address imported carbon in goods if we are going to manage this problem globally. And let me just whistle through um, this. We need a completely new view of economics if we're going to move forward. We need to integrate economics with the story that is developed through science. We need to integrate our thinking. At the moment, we have a single economic view of the world, which is exponential growth is good forever. I don't believe we can manage that by burning up resources to fuel that process. What we need is management of the state of our ecosystems, whether it's the air we breathe, the oceans I haven't mentioned. There will be no big fish left in the oceans in 20 years' time at the rate we are destroying the ecosystem of the oceans by our mechanisms of fishing. And we need to optimize human well-being. This model here is a far less crude way of looking at our economic well-being than simple one-number GDP. We need to take on board what is good for us and try what is the we in that sentence. I'm afraid we is the global population. We also need to strengthen, not continue to weaken, that wonderful alliance called the United Nations that was set up in a fit of idealism after the Second World War. We, there will be no more war, world wars. We are faced with a crisis far greater than was faced by the world in setting up the United Nations. The United Nations is no longer fit for purpose. We need to re-establish an international body that can address these issues. Thank you. We've got just about 10 minutes. Oh. 
Oh, right. I'm very pleased to say that we've been given an extension and that uh, we have got about 20 minutes for you to ask, I'm sure, one of the many questions this uh, uh, demonstration from the horse's mouth, as it were, uh, has, will have roused in you. And I'm going to let Sir David choose who to talk to. Please. So the question is, what are my views on fracking and will shale oil help us? Shale oil, first of all, um, we're making up that gap right now between crude oil production and the demand by going to shale oil, uh, by going into deep sea. Uh, so if, if we look at the Gulf of Mexico, it's now producing a few million barrels a day. Remember, it's only a few million, though. And uh, at what cost? We were pushing the technology far too quickly. At what cost in Alberta? The situation there is that uh, the energy cost per unit of energy produced is about two. Uh, the water cost per unit of energy produced is very, very high, and the damage to the local environment is enormous. The cost of producing oil from shale, and by the way, it's not shale oil, it's shale tar. You have to take it as sticky tar Treat it with, at very high temperatures with steam and methane to convert it to oil. That's why it's an energy intensive process. You're really starting with something that's close to coal. So that is a way forward, but only if you really want to keep this fix we have on oil. The alternatives are actually cheaper. So uh, shale oil, uh, I do not believe any analysis will indicate uh, an increase in shale oil production beyond three or four million barrels a day. Now, the current position is 75 million barrels a day of crude oil. To reach what is needed in five years' time is more like 20 million barrels a day. The average oil field is depleting at 5% per annum around the world. Right? So we, we're not going to make it up. Uh, in terms of gas fracking, um, there's an enormous amount of hype around. I believe the hype will probably get Barack Obama re-elected. Uh, the, the, the news in America is that we can be energy independent. If you actually look at the details, uh, Fayetteville, for example, the first of the great fracking fields, uh, is uh, shut down. The reason it's shut down is when you uh, split one of these geological strata with uh, high pressure of uh, sand and water, it, uh, initially you get a great burst of gas, but as you keep going, you have to push harder and harder to keep the gas supply up, and eventually it becomes non-economic. So although the estimates of the amount of shale gas are good, the amount of shale gas that's economically recoverable are far smaller than that, far smaller. So watch out for hype on both of those. Okay. Hello? Just checking the mic. <coughs> Sorry. Ah, oh, you had a next question. No, sorry. Um, so, I saw an attractive <laughs> face. You're a physicist. I'm also a physicist. I think we both know that uh, the way forward is probably fusion. Um, is there any hope internationally of this being developed? Um, what's the status, basically? Um, one, one of my greatest honors was given to me by the French president for the work that I did on fusion, so I'm very happy to answer that. Uh, the, the big fusion project, uh, the, the, the most successful fusion project is uh, just outside Oxford um, and JET has, uh, has produced a demonstration uh, for a very short period of time of the feasibility of fusion. Um, and the next fusion project is ITER, which will be built, is being built in Cadarache now at a cost of around 10 billion euro. It's the size of a large cathedral and um, it's, uh, it's a, a wonderful enterprise. We will find out in 20 years' time whether or not we can then commercialize it. Um, I, I think the, the fusion project is, of course, attractive because the, the fuel uh, is deuterium, uh, enough deuterium in one bath of water, and enough lithium, the other fuel, in your uh, computer battery, uh, to provide all the energy for any individual as we move forward in time for their lifetime. So uh, fusion is a highly efficient potential process for energy production. 
and the ash of the process is helium. And I'm telling you things you know, I'm just using your question as a means of telling the audience. It is, is extraordinarily attractive. Fusion is what drives the sun. It puzzled physicists at the end of the 19th uh, century. Why was the sun lasting so long? Is this uh, remarkable nuclear process. Uh, what are the chances of success? 50-50. The plasma physics is not the problem. In my view, that's a solvable problem with rapid electromagnetic uh, design. Um, the you know, microsecond switching of electromagnet, you can contain the instabilities of the plasma. The big problem, in my view, is the container. Um, we don't yet have the material that would last 50 years under the sustained bombardment of high energy neutrons. And yet I haven't been able to persuade the international community to put as much money into materials research as they're putting into plasma physics. If you're a plasma physicist, then, I, then I'm congratulating you on your success, but it's, it's the materials that need to be examined. Inertial confinement is, is a possibility, and I believe all these experiments should be conducted, but at the moment, the, um, the JET program is the best we have going, and I think that should be pursued uh, with the greatest level of effort. I'm, uh, I'm guilty of looking. Have you got somebody in mind? There we go. Thank you. An, an astoundingly good talk, uh, Sir David. My question is that what you're proposing, this lean green stimulus, sounds a bit similar to what Barack Obama was proposing when he came in with his green stimulus. And from what I've read, there's a lot of disappointment that it hasn't really had the transformation that was hoped for. How is what you're proposing different and how will it succeed whereas that hasn't? Um, what, what we're talking about is public-private partnership. The efficiency of the private sector being combined with stimulus from public funding. When I was in government, we set up the Energy Technologies Institute, which was half a billion from government money. I persuaded Gordon Brown to provide that, and I raised half a billion from industry. And that institute is now the cutting edge of new energy technologies in Britain. The idea was to stimulate those private sector companies to move in that direction and then to, for them to invest more heavily. Um, I believe that at the moment, there are a full range of infrastructure projects on the table. I would examine each of those projects in terms of their viability over the current 50 years to see whether or not they're going to be fit for purpose in a zero carbon and resource constrained world. Um, and I would put, for example, since I'm standing here, the seven barrages uh, fairly high up on the list. Seven barrages. Uh, has, a consortium has been set up. The cost of, of building it would be about 21 billion pounds. Large investment for employment into the local community around the seven um, and over a significant period of time. And the, once the infrastructure is up, you would have average three gigawatts of energy. And for how long? 200 years plus with very low maintenance costs. So the return for the economy in Britain of that stimulus, short-term stimulus in employment, would be a continuing energy source for the region well into the future. The, the lifetime of a barrage is, uh, is really dependent on whether people decide to keep it going in 100, 200 years' time. Difficult for economists, by the way, to evaluate that. Every economist I talk to hesitates at going beyond a repayment period of 20 years. And if the repayment period, as it is on the seven barrage, is 25, they simply give the advice, don't build it, which I believe is absurd. Uh, thank you, David, for an excellent talk. Um, as I understand it, you're talking about a combination of innovation and behavioral change being the things which really uh, make a, a massive difference. And, and your proposition is that we can do the innovation. In other words, science and technology can actually deliver solutions given the support. So uh, the question is about behavioral change. And there seems to me to be two types of behavioral change. One is individuals. We can all do our bit, as it were. Um, but the massive behavioral change seems to be in the political dimension. How do you think that might change? I, I think the, the behavioral change I'm talking about um, is in, if you like, three different compartments. Uh, what, one is the uh, individual and 
if I could couple the individual into um, NGO type activity, the, the way in which BHA type activity, the way in which we stimulate each other to think and move, uh, so joint and collective action within that, of people. Uh, the other is private sector companies, and um, there are very good examples. I, I think Paul Polman, for example, at Unilever, has turned that company around with his business of life cycle analysis of every product that goes out of the company. Uh, um, the, the, uh, it's a stunning example. He no longer gives quarterly uh, results. He simply refused to let his shareholders have quarterly results because his message is, you invest in this company, we're a long-term company. We have a 20, 30-year vision. Don't, uh, don't invest in us if you plan to move your money out one microsecond later. Um, so I, I think the sec second is the, is the private sector. The third is government. Now, government, th these all interact with each other. Uh, private sector companies are very sensitive to the fact that y you may not buy their goods if they get a bad reputation. And this has been very, very clear. I can give you quite a few examples of that happening. Um, on the other hand, governments want to be re-elected. So they are very sensitive to what the people want. So the, these three are very strongly interactive. I think, again, you know, I've got an example here of a many-body problem. I was studying microbiology in Glasgow University 50 years ago, and they were confidently predicting that we would have understood photosynthesis in a very short time. Oops, sorry, and that we Sorry? Confidently predicting? That we would have understood photosynthesis, unpicked photosynthesis, and be carrying out synthetic photosynthesis, and biofuels would replace fossil fuels very shortly. This hasn't happened. Is that because it was too complex, or there was lack of investment, and are biofuels going to hold the, the answers in the future for us? Well, that's an extraordinarily good question, um, uh, and it's an area that I've done a fair bit of research into. The, the um, the answer is that biomimicry is still a very important tool for us to use. But um, the, the business of evolution has produced such complex solutions that we are finding it very difficult to imitate them. So if I, if I take photosynthesis uh, uh, and you look at all, again, the hype of removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere using photosynthetic mimicry, there is nothing comes close to a tropical forest for removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So we, we, we have just not succeeded because of the complexity of that process. Uh, we have just not mimicked it very well. But at the same time, I think that um, our, our ability to convert solar energy into useful energy is a major key to the future. Uh, we, we arrived on the planet out of that evolutionary process by using solar energy for most of our energy needs, and we can return to that situation. Thousands of times more solar energy reaching the planet's surface than we need to convert into useful energy. So that is a very important pathway. And the, uh, interestingly, not biomimicry, but out of plastics, there's now emerging photovoltaics made of plastic, not of silicon which are therefore hundreds of times cheaper than silicon-based photovoltaics. Eventually, I believe we'll have paint that will dry into a plastic photovoltaic uh, so that you can cover the outside of your building with beautiful colors and also generate electricity from the sun landing on the outside of your building. So I think there are some very exciting developments taking place. But the biomimicry is a tough call. Sorry, can I keep making you run up and down? <laughs> I had a call English today, so I have to do with it. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, excellent talk. Um, I'm wondering whether you have any greater insight now into the machinations of the political class in terms of their resistance to scientific truth. That when you present scientific facts, there seems to be this wonderful capacity on the part of political leaders to fire the messenger. When I got into government, 
um, we, we had just, uh, we were coming out of the BSE crisis. And um, I had land on my desk the 17 volumes of the Phillips Commission report into the BSE crisis. The first volume became my Bible for my action in government. Um, it's a beautifully written account of exactly the point that you're raising. And basically what Phillips said was that what had happened was the political community was making decisions despite the advice of the scientists and then instructing the scientists in government to follow the line. And Philip said that should never happen again. Uh, when I was in government, uh, and when I was asked to take the post, I said to the Prime Minister, I have a condition, which is when I give you advice, three months later that advice goes into the public domain, unless it's an issue of national security. And I managed to keep to that. He was very surprised and taken aback, and then once I'd explained to him, I have to keep the trust of the public so that the public has trust in government. He understood that. Now, it, sometimes we had quite a rough time together, but I insisted on that throughout. Um, it's, a, it's a line that every science advisor within government needs to take, which is to keep the public on side and at the same time the politicians. So in my time in government, Going from a single chief scientific advisor, I now have put in place a chief scientific advisor in every government department. Critically, they are brought in from outside. My, my fear is that civil servants know how to toe the line of the political masters. Uh, if you bring a, a, a scientist in from outside, their integrity, and that's what I said to Prime Minister, my integrity is the only property I'm really keen to protect. I will not lie to anybody and therefore put my own integrity at risk. And I think most academics take that position. Uh, a green, did you find somebody up there? I'll try and follow you next time. <laughs> I'm just trying to keep out the way. <laughs> Thank you. I think I've got a much easier question. <laughs> um, and one that I might be able to understand the answer to too. Could you give us um, the top five tips you would say as individuals that we can do right now when we leave the room to help this situation? Well, after last night, keep stroking each other. 